All right, welcome back to another edition of We Rise Fighting Labor Podcast. We bring you today's labor news, history, and analysis from the U.S. and around the world. This is a podcast you listen to with your fellow workers organizing on the shop floor. This is a podcast you listen to before walking into your union meeting. As always, I'm Rico Rutia here with my co-host Brian Pfeiffer. In this episode, we're going to bring you this week's labor news. We're going to talk about unions in Cambodia, Great Britain, the Teamsters and UPS, the Writers Guild strike, the OPEIU strike in Wisconsin, and the Doctor Strike in New York. All of that coming up right after we check out this jam. This one's called The Preacher and the Slave. It's a song that was written by Joe Hill of the Industrial Workers of the World. I decided to share this because 110 years ago, thousands of dock workers in Philadelphia won their two-week strike for a pay increase in union recognition. They had recently joined the Industrial Workers of the World chartered as Local 8. This local branch had more black members than any other Wobbly, or IWW, branch, led by the African-American dock worker Ben Fletcher. Local 8 was probably the most racially and ethnically integrated union in the United States during World War I. Black and Irish workers, Eastern European migrants, and others all belonged. Local 8 was also among the most durable branches of the IWW, dominating the waterfront, despite massive employer and government repression for almost a decade. All of that, according to Working Class History on Instagram, and gonna share the song now, I hope you enjoy. The long-haired preachers come out every night, I try to tell you what's wrong and what's right, but when asked about something to eat, uh, they will answer in voices so sweet. You will eat, you will eat by and by. In that glorious land in the sky, way up high, work and pray. Uh, live on hay. Uh, you get by in the sky when you die, that's the lie. The starvation army they play. And they shout and they clap and they pray. Uh, when they got all your coins on the drum, uh, they will tell you when you're on the bomb. You will eat, you will eat by and by, in that glorious land in the sky, way up high, work and pray, uh, live on hay. All right, welcome back, everyone. And if you're a regular listener to We Rise Fighting Labor podcast, you know that we cover strikes and we talk about this little upsurge or whatever you want to call it, this rise in activity in the labor movement. And, you know, today, Comrade Kriegler was kind enough to send a few articles that spoke to this, um, or better stated, a press release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that spoke to this. And I wanted to just read out one excerpt. Uh, from this. And again, this is this is from February from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the excerpt reads as follows. In 2022, there were 23 major work stoppages beginning in the year. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported today. Again, this is in February. The lowest annual total of major work stoppages was five in 2009, and the highest was 470 in 1952. Okay, so five major strikes in 2009, and 470 strikes in 1952. Between the years 2002 and 2022, there have been an average of 16 work stoppages beginning in the year. So again, 16 big strikes on average. And finally, a major work stoppage involves 1,000 or more workers and lasts at least one shift during the work week, Monday through Friday, excluding federal holidays. So that's just to give folks an idea of some of the major strikes, some of the major activities that have taken place um, in 2022. And again, the numbers for 2022 were released in February. So I have to wait on that a couple of months and we're a little delayed on reporting it. But I thought it was worth watching because this is the type of thing that we talk about. Now, another thing that we have spoken about on this show uh, is the Cornell School of Industrial Relations website has a feature called Strike Tracker. And as the name suggests, um, this website tracks strikes. It tracks strikes in the U.S. Um, It tracks them by location, by industry, by the worker demands, the number of participants in the strike, the duration, 
and the labor organization. So it's a very handy tool. And I just wanted to uh, bring this up again because Jerry had brought this up in a previous episode and just wanted to highlight it because I also had a, an opportunity to check it out today and just wanted to put it out there again as a handy tool. So Strike Tracker, you're able to check out different strikes and labor actions, I should say. They make that distinction between labor protests and labor strikes. And the distinction that they make is that in a labor strike, of course, the workers remove their labor. In a labor protest, they don't do that, which I think it's an I think that's an important distinction in this context and in general, uh, because, you know, I've been to protests that have been hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, I take a minute to reflect. I'm like, what are we really doing here? You know, we're converging in mass and no doubt. Um, expressing our protesting vote against something, but a strike is something different because a strike, you know, you're talking about stopping production. You're talking about affecting profits, affecting revenue. Uh, you're creating uncertainty for shareholders, for bosses, for owners. So there are two very different things. And I appreciate that uh, the Strike Tracker website makes that distinction. So moving on to some news, we're going to start with some international coverage today. Uh, the headline from this Associated Press article reads as follows, Cambodian union chief who led long-running casino strike gets a two-year prison sentence. Now, first off, I don't like it when they talk about a union chief, um, but nevertheless, I read the headline word for word. Here we go. Uh, this is in Cambodia. A labor union leader who led a long-running strike against Cambodia's biggest casino was sentenced Thursday to two years in prison for incitement to commit a felony, while eight fellow union members received lesser terms that do not include time behind bars. Chim Sitar, president of the labor rights supported union of Kamar employees of Naga World, has been leading a strike that began in 2021, December 2021, in protest of mass layoffs and alleged union busting at the Naga World Casino in the capital Phnom Penh. She was convicted on a charge of leading a January 2022 demonstration of nearly 400 other dismissed employees who were demanding to be rehired. Naga World in late 2021 had dismissed 373 employees and financial struggles amid financial struggles related to the corona pandemic. Naga World is owned by a company controlled by the family of Malaysian billionaire Chep Lip Kyung. His company received its casino licenses in 1994, and the property is now a huge integrated hotel casino entertainment complex. Labor union actions are not rare in Cambodia, but usually take place at factories in outlying areas or industrial estates in other provinces. Protests by the Naga World workers in the capital was unusually high profile and drew police action that was sometimes violent. Of course it was. Uh, Judge Xiong Shakrik Shakriya, I'm probably mispronouncing that, apologies, of the Phnom Penh Municipal Court sends five of Chim's Sitar's co-defendants on the same charge to provisional prison terms of one and a half years each, allowing them their freedom on the condition that they are subject to appearing before the court or other authorities whenever summoned. Three other defendants received one-year suspended sentences. Chim Sitar, wearing an orange prison uniform, looked healthy and relaxed before the verdict. Asked about the court hearing, she told the Associated Press, Yes, I know the court will convict and sentence me, and of course I will appeal, unquote. And the quote continues, I will appeal because I can't accept the verdict, and I want the international community to know of our struggle, she said. As she was driven away from the verdict, she smiled at a group of supporters outside the court and raised a defiant fist. So one of those last sentences brings home why we cover international struggles. You know, sometimes workers in other nations want us to know, want us to be able to connect our labor struggles. So I needed to highlight that. Um, so solidarity to workers in Cambodia at Naga World. Um, we will continue to keep you updated on this. Uh, next, we continue with our international coverage and go to Britain. Uh, this article comes from UniteTheUnion.org, and the headline reads, Strike to hit supplies of Coca-Cola, Sprite, and Fanta this summer. And the body of the article reads as follows. Workers are now strikes at Europe's biggest soft drink plant. Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners offers a, re a real terms pay cut whilst profits rose 37% to 2.1 billion euros. 
Offering workers a real terms pay cut while business is booming is nothing short of corporate greed. A series of strikes will hit supplies of Britain's favorite soft drinks this summer because the hugely profitable Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners, or CCEP, won't pay workers a fair wage which matches inflation. The workers are planning 14 days of strikes between Thursday, June 8th and Thursday, June 22nd. Hundreds of workers at the largest soft, plant, soft drink plants in Europe in Wakefield have voted for industrial action by a margin of 87% in protest over a pay offer, which does not, which does nothing to address the cost of living increases and crisis. Uh, this is after CE, CCEP generated revenues of over 17 billion euros combined with an operating profit of 2.1 billion euros. The CCEP wage deal across different grades amounts to an average of six of a six percent increase. That's gone flat with the workers when inflation is still booming. Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham said, quote, Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners is making profits in the billions, but it's delivering a pay cut to its very workers who are making them. Its profits are up 37% to an astronomical 2.1 uh, billion euros. Offering workers a real terms pay cut when business is booming is nothing short of corporate greed. The workforce are rightfully furious at the company's profiteering. Uh, the workers at Wakefield have Unite's total support. CCEP Wakefield can produce 360,000 cans per hour and 132 bottles per hour. CCEP's products include Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Dr. Pepper, Fanta, Fanta Lemon, Fanta Fruit Twist, Sprite, Monster, and Relentless. The plant also produces Schweppes, Tonic, Diet Tonic, Bitter Lemon, Ginger Ale, and Lemonade. You know, Brian, you and I were talking about this article right before we jumped on, and we were talking about how important it is to know some of these facts that were presented in this article. If we're going to think of a world outside of capitalism, if we're going to think of a world beyond capitalism, if we're going to take the idea of building a new world from the shell of the old seriously, then we need to take some notes of as to what's happening here and how the world is run right now, what, what, the, what production looks like. So there were a couple of things in this article that I wanted to point out. Number one, I wanted to point out how the article makes reference to hundreds of workers at the largest soft drinks plant in Europe. So hundreds. So we're not talking 200,000. We're not talking 500,000. We're not talking a million workers. We're talking hundreds. So let's, um, let, let's err on the side of saying that this is 900 workers, all right, just for the sake of argument. Uh, the latter part of this article talks about how this particular plant can produce 360,000 cans per hour or 132,000 bottles per hour. Again, this is just hundreds of workers being able to produce this much. So we bring this up because we encourage you to, to envision a world beyond capitalism and what that would look like so we can start to connect the dots and plan you know i think that's one of the things that's missing in capitalism is planned economics right now our economics are geared towards making profits for ceos shareholders business owners stuff like that and it doesn't plan for the needs of humans um so i think it's important to take note of numbers like this whenever we see them what do you think brian that's right rick can you imagine if the means of production at this plant alone were controlled by the workers? And it goes to show that technology isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the question is, who controls the technology and who controls the means of production? That's as right. You raised, yep. As you raised, Rick, uh, here we are making soda, uh, workers making soda, which might or might not be important, depending upon whom you are. But look at what we need in the world and what we could be doing if we had control well, not only these means of production, but around the world. And also, as you raised previously, the international component of this as well, and the power specifically with this strike coming up, we talk a lot about the transportation sector on We Rise Fighting and the potential international solidarity that could open up with this strike in Europe and what's going on in the U.S. this summer. This could be a profound international situation if some connections were, start, were increased. They already are there a bit, but it could be quite something, especially with the Teamsters, the uh, transport workers and a whole variety of industries within North America, as well as around the world, teaming up with uh, the workers here at this company in Europe. That's right. We we just recently reported on the Teamsters in Pennsylvania in a Coca-Cola factory there. So that's why we bring this stuff up is 
you know, so we can start to connect those dots. So our labor movement looks different. You know, <clears throat> Brian, when you and I went to Racine, you know, I made this point and it's just coming to my mind right now. You know, prior to the UAW, prior to workers organizing into the United Auto Workers, the workforce was really divided and it still was afterwards. Um, but one of the key things that helped the United, the United Auto Workers come together is when its organizers started pushing the idea, hey, no, we're not going to make this happen if there's no racial solidarity. You know, and this in the age of Jim Crow and segregated communities and stuff like that, where it's like, it just, it, no, it was out of the question, you know, so same thing now. Um, and this was the point that I made in Racine is that we have to think of these other workers and other other lands or, as our next door neighbors, you know, because this is something that is threatening to business owners, to corporate, to multinational corporations. I mean, listen to that. You know, so this is the sort of thing that helps us strike back and take a blow at um, capitalism, at uh, capitalist firms, you know, and just advance the struggle internationally. So we will continue to um, report on this. And up next, Brian, that's you with OPEIU. What's going on with Local 39? All right, Rick, uh, the Office of Professional Employees International Union, Local 39 strike continues at a, it's now called True Stage, formerly CUNA Mutual Group. The strike started on May 19th, originally scheduled for a five day strike. The workers last week had a meeting and the majority, well over 90%, voted to continue the strike, which most likely will go into June. The Wisconsin AFL CIO produced an email and distributed that this weekend. There's 450 workers represented by the by OPEIU at True Stage, and they've been on an unfair labor practice strike. Will Roberts, a media specialist and member of the union, said, quote, I'm voting to authorize an extension of the strike because we're all prepared to do what it takes to get True Stage to stop breaking the law and to secure a just contract. Tuta Rasad, a programmer and union member for over 25 years, said, this strike has united us even more. And will not stop until we get what we deserve. And the Wisconsin AFL CIO president, Stephanie Bloomingdale, who's been on the picket lines, joined the strike line in Madison, bringing solidarity and support from tens of thousands of union members across Wisconsin. She said, There, we stand with you united as one strong labor movement. Together, we will stay united to ensure every working person gets what they deserve. So the strike fundamentally is over various issues, including. Outsourcing, 20 years ago, there were 1,650, approximately 1,650 members at True Stage, formerly CUNA. Now there's about 450 union members there. This is the first strike since 2011 in the Madison area, since the Union Busting uh, Act 10 was passed, which is a public sector a bill that was passed and implemented into state statute that eliminates virtually all collective bargaining for public sector workers. And then in 2015, right to work for less, these Jim Crow laws that was passed in 2015 and implemented in Wisconsin, as well as other anti-union laws. So these courageous and brave workers are going on strike for their contract uh, at True Stage, but also this has implications for the entire labor movement in Wisconsin. And some would say nationwide, if some of these issues that they're fighting are outsourcing, uh, and that includes some workers that are being uh, working, union members working next to workers or virtual workers who are making much less than them because the virtual workers or the outsourced workers are not in the union and the company has set that up. Um, and also the company wants to eliminate the pension program, which would devastate not only retirees, but also workers just starting out with their job. And of course, wage increases are a part of this with inflation and other demands. So this strike continues and members can show your support, labor community union members, and also students. There's a lot of universities there. They've also been on the picket lines, which run from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday at 5910 Mineral Point Road. Parking is available at Garner Park there in Madison, Wisconsin. There is a variety of ways that Supporters can help. There's a strike fund link, online solidarity petition, and of course, always sharing the information online 
the virtual workers are sharing a lot of this information as well. And this is all available at the South Central Federation of Labor in Madison or at the OPEIU Local 39 Facebook page, Twitter, and other social media. So solidarity with OPEIU, we wish you well again in your strike that continues this week. We're there for you. And, and uh, if listeners want to find out more information, we did interview President Catherine a couple weeks back on We Rise Fighting, and you can check out that episode as well. All right, Rick, we're going to get back to the Teamsters. Yeah, just an update on the Teamsters. So I checked out the Teamsters website, no press release, so nothing new on the Teamsters UPS stuff. I also checked out the UPS Investor Relations website to see if there was any new press release relating to negotiation and nothing. So I did find uh, an article from the Associated Press and it reads as follows. Living in New York City, working full time and without a car, Jessica Ray and her husband have come to rely on deliveries of food and just about everything else for their home. It has meant more free time on weekends with their young son rather than standing in line for toilet paper or dragging heavy bags of dog food back to their apartment. I don't even know where to buy dog food, said Jessica Ray of the specialty food she buys for her family's aging dog. There are millions of families like the Rays who have swapped store visits for doorstep deliveries in recent years, meaning that contentious labor negotiations now underway at UPS have become vastly more disruptive than the last time it happened in 1997, when a scrappy upstart called Amazon.com became a public company. UPS delivers millions more packages every day than it did just five years ago, and its 350,000 unionized workers, represented by the Teamsters, still seethe about a contract they feel was forced on them in 2018. And in an environment of energized labor movements and lingering resentment among UPS workers, the Teamsters are expected to dig in with the potential to cow a major logistical force in the U.S. The 24 million packages UPS ships on an average day amounts to about a quarter of all U.S. parcel volume, according to the global shipping and logistics firm Pitney Bowes, or as UPS puts it, the equivalent of about 6% of the nation's gross domestic product. Higher prices and long wait times are all but certain if there is an impasse. Now, a couple of highlights from this article. You know, Brian, as I was, as we were talking before we started recording, man, maybe, maybe that's where some of the juicier stuff happens. But as we were talking before uh, we started recording today, you know, this article is a little bit, quote unquote, triggering for me, um, <clears throat> just because it reminded me of the potential real of the rail strike that almost happened last year and how the news media went around in chorus saying $2 billion a day, $2 billion a day, $2 billion a day. The strike is going to cost the economy $2 billion a day. So as I'm reading through this article, you know, I caught a couple of things. Um, one is how they announced, of course, it's understood UPS delivers millions more packages per day uh, every day than it did just five years ago. Um, and it also talks about the 24 million packages UPS ships on an average day, which amounts to a quarter of all U.S. parcel volume. You know, so I just want to start putting that out there just just so at least our listeners know how to read this stuff and how to understand this stuff, because, you know, that's going to be the next scare tactic. You know, is it going to be, oh, all of a sudden the Teamsters are on strike. We're inconvenienced at a rate of 24 million packages per day. You know, whereas we really should be reading this stuff the opposite way, right? Like the articles like these give value to the labor of these workers. You know, if it wasn't for these 350,000 Teamsters, 24 million packages per day wouldn't move. That's right. And that speaks to their power. All right. And that is, again, important. Going back to what I was just saying, the distinction between a protest and a strike. A strike actually goes for the profits. A strike actually goes for the revenues. A strike disrupts things. And industries, industry CEOs, ind industry shareholders take note of what happens in a strike. So if we can support UPS workers and their the Teamsters in their struggle against UPS, you know, now is the time to do it. This is an important struggle that could have implications for, of course, other union workers, but just implications for the U.S. working class as a whole, because this is the largest labor contract, largest private sector labor contract in North America. So what they negotiate can affect what else happens in, 
in this economy. So I wanted to make those couple of highlights just in case we do have that coming down the pike. You know, UPS workers will disrupt the economy at a rate of 24 million packages per day. Spare me, spare us. No, their labor is worth 24 million packages a day. You know, without their labor, that stops. They are critical. So that's a point I wanted to make with, with that article. That's right, Rick. I just can add a couple things on that, that the there is a lot of public support for the Teamsters all, all over this country. It's the, the fellow workers who are sending these packages know that it was the Teamsters that were the ones that kept their families alive, that got the medicine in the mail, that got their food in the mail, that helps keep them literally alive during the pandemic. And on top of that, this article also, I appreciate comments about confronting the corporate media on these questions, and they should be reporting on the lives, or at least ask questions about why aren't they reporting on the lives of the Teamsters and the package handlers and the drivers who are getting up at all hours of the day and night in winter, in very, in the South, in Texas, in Florida, all over the country. It's very hot during the summer. Uh, the stress that it puts on the Teamsters bodies going up and down stairs and elevators all day and having to stop and start your vehicle and drive vehicles uh, multiple times a day. Sometimes the vehicles don't work. They're not serviced uh, by the company. It doesn't pay properly to have them serviced. Uh, all the things that the UPS uh, Teamsters do to make sure those 24 million packages dry are, are delivered every single day and delivered efficiently and on time. And uh, also remembering our sorters inside of the, the packaging plants who are a lot of, many of them are part-time. Many of them have many uh, medical challenges. They, they get, many of them get carpal tunnel from the thousands and thousands of packages that they move every day. So these are many of the issues that are being put forth by the Teamsters as well as of course wages and uh, demanding a decent pension plan and an improved pension plan. But it's also that they, their daily lives are worth more than the company profits. We know that, but also these workers are the ones who make the profits and they deserve that. And we will fight with them on the lines. And this has the capacity to transform the labor movement in this country this summer. And right now there's contract campaigns happening literally for every single state, multiple different cities. And there is a groundswell of community and union support for our fellow workers, the Teamsters, fighting for a just contract at UPS. So right on, Rick. Yeah, right on. I hope, you know, the Teamsters get what they demand. You know, again, um, if you want to learn more about the 1997 strike at UPS, we did an episode exclusively on that. And, you know, I guess maybe the last thing that I would like to highlight is uh, maybe some folks who listen to our show, you know, know a little bit of something about the, the labor movement. They've heard of organizations like Fight for 15 and the Service Employees Union demanding a $15 minimum wage. Man, you know. The Teamsters won that in their 1997 contract with UPS for part-time workers. It kicked in in 2003, but they won that. You know, this is long before Occupy, and Occupy was what popularized the $15 uh, demand, and that happened in 2009. So even before all of that, before Fight for 15, before SEIU took on the cost, before Occupy, no, the Teamsters did that. The Teamsters did that in their 1997 UPS contract. If you would like to know more details about how that was done, what the struggle entailed, what it looked like, you know, check out our previous episode specifically on the 1997 Teamster strike at UPS. Uh, that was a historic moment for U.S. labor. So we recommend you check it out. Now, next, continuing on with strikes, we are reporting this time about the Writers Guild strike, and the Writers Guild strike continues. Um, went to their website to see if I could find a recent press release, not so much, but I did find something that I thought was worth sharing. Um, part of in one section of the website is called the cost of settling, and this is from May 16th. Um, and here, let me just read it and then describe what's going on. So on this page, the Writers Guild writes, Dear members, 
The Writers Guild of America has now been on strike for two weeks. Uh, now it's almost four uh, because the AMPTP refuses to negotiate a fair deal to address the existential crisis writings, writers are facing. The Writers Guild estimates the proposals on the table at contract expiration on May 1st would cost the industry collectively $429 million per year, approximately $343 million of which is attributable to eight of the largest employers. Eight of our largest employers. For perspective, tens of billions of dollars are spent on the programming writers create, 19 billion alone on, or, on original content for streaming services this year. And the cost of these proposed improvements is a mod, is modest compared to industry revenues and profits, but are essential to writers whose pay and working condition have, conditions have eroded over the past decade. What would the cost of our contract proposals currently on the table look like on a company by company basis? Take a look. And this is where the Writers Guild presents us with a table of what their propose, what their contract language proposal costs uh, next to a comparison of what the company makes in revenues. And then finally, a column on what the costs of their contract demands are in comparison to the annual revenues of each of these companies. So for instance, uh, with Disney, the Writers Guild, their annual cost, um, as far as their, their contract demands, would amount to $75 million, okay? Disney has annual revenues of 82.7 billion, with a B, billion dollars, okay? Now, what percent of the revenues is the $75 million that the Writers Guild is demanding? That's 0.091% of the total annual revenues of Disney. So let's do one more. Uh, Warner Brothers and Discovery. <clears throat> the demand there, the contract demand there amounts to $47 million. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery is a $43.1 billion corporation bringing in $43.1 billion in annual revenues. So the demand of the Writers Guild amounts to 0.108% of total revenues and so on and so forth with a handful of other corporations. It's never more than 0.2%. That was the highest. It's never more than that amount. So I appreciate these numbers because it gives context um, as to what's being demanded. It gives actual concrete numbers. Um, and it also highlights exactly how these corporations will just nickel and dime writers, will nickel and dime workers. You know, I think it's important to always look at numbers like annual revenues and, you know, get a sense of what your demand amounts to in comparison to the annual revenues, because it's usually something absurd like this. And then these corporations try to paint the workers as greedy union workers, irrational union workers. They're costing Hollywood X billion dollars a day. You know what? No, here are the numbers, you know. Mm -hmm. And if it does cost Hollywood X billion dollars a day, good. Meet the demands of the workers. It's settled. It's that simple. Same thing with the Teamsters and UPS. You know, same thing with any strike. Moving on here, we have, um, I actually really enjoyed this this article. So the headline here reads, Historic New York Doctor Strike Points to Growing Labor Movement. And this is from Politico.com. And the article reads, A strike this week by resident physicians at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, a public hospital serving one of the world's most ethnically diverse communities, lasted just three days. Only 130 doctors participated. Now, I highlighted that. We're going to get back to that. Only 130 doctors participated. Still, it was enough to make history. The work stoppage, which started Monday and culminated Wednesday with a tentative deal, was the first doctor strike in the city in over three decades, according to the Committee of Interns and Residents, the union representing the, phys the physicians. Such strikes are relatively rare in the U.S. because many doctors are self-employed or work at hospitals as independent contractors rather than employees, which prevents them from joining a union. Only about 7% of practicing physicians across the U.S. belong to unions, census data indicate. But across the country, the pandemic has spurred a rapid rise in unionization among residents, a term for recent medical school graduates working at a hospital under, the doctor, under a doctor's supervision. 
If presidents at Mass General Brigham in Boston voted to unionize in an election that kicks off next week, a record 20% of all resident physicians in the U.S. would have union representation, said Sanyara Altenor, a spokesperson for the Committee of Interns and Residents. The group now represents 27,000 resident physicians and fellows across the U.S. 8,000 of them joined after 2019, an unprecedented pace, Altenor said. Last year, a group of 1,300 resident physicians in California became the first in decades to authorize the strike, although they secured new contracts before walking off the job, according to the Committee of Interns and Residents. A similar situation unfolded earlier this month at Flushing and Jamaica hospitals, also in Queens, just hours before residents were set to commence a strike. And there's still a looming possibility of a walkout by 500 residents at two private hospitals in Manhattan after the doctors announced Monday that they had voted to authorize a strike. Rebecca Given, an associate professor of labor studies and employment relations at Rutgers University, tied the trend to the COVID pandemic's exposure of staffing inadequacies and dangerous working conditions at hospitals across the U.S., Elmhurst Hospital was an early epicenter of the pandemic, serving as a bellwether of COVID's rapid overwhelming of the U.S. healthcare system. At one point in the pandemic's first wave, the hospital saw more than a dozen patients die in a 24-hour period. But Gavon said that unionization push is also part of a broader generational shift of young people becoming more aware of systemic workforce inequities, not just a phenomenon un- unique to healthcare uh, workers. Similar waves have, stre- have swept over legislative chambers, newsrooms, and tech companies. We see, we see lots of young, highly educated workers unionizing in notably increased numbers, she said in an interview. At Elmhurst, a public hospital that predominantly serves low-income and immigrant communities, union members said a typical first-year resident earns $68,000. The same resident would earn thousands more across the East River at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan, even though Mount Sinai's Akon School of Medicine runs both residency programs. It feels fundamentally, oh, I'm sorry, this is a quote. Quote, it feels fundamentally like Mount Sinai is saying that this community does not matter, Joya Dupre, a resident in internal medicine, said in the statement on the first day of the strike, like we as Elmhurst residents do not matter as largely immigrant union doctors. Residents picking outside the hospital, hospital's main entrance this week wielded cherry red noisemakers and signs in English and Spanish that spoke to their frustrations. Care for the caretaker, said one said one sign. Why not Elmhurst, said another sign. Between wage increases, a $2,000 ratification bonus and benefits of the Elmhurst residents' tentative agreements satisfies the demand for pay parity with their non-unionized counterparts at Mount Sinai Hospital, according to the union. Contract negotiations had stretched about 11 months. All right, let's highlight that too. Contract negotiations had stretched about 11 months. Given said that resident success could inspire similar actions across the country amongst health staff, a catch call term for doctors in residency. It's possible this will be the start of health staff also saying we have to be willing to strike for patient care if we're really going to win improvements, Given said. I'm sure health staff across the country are paying very, very close attention. Now, to the highlights that I wanted to talk about. The first highlight in this article I wanted to talk about was at the very beginning and how the article said that only 130 doctors participated. Now, I wanted to highlight this in any article when you're reading about a strike, if they make any kind of reference like that. And honestly, I don't know the political leanings from uh, this this journalist. I'm guessing it's a little bit on the liberal progressive um, tilt. But the journalist makes reference to only 130 doctors participated in the strike. And I think that's really important because, you know, they usually the capitalist media wants you to believe, you know, only 130 doctors participated. In other words, it doesn't have popular support. And, you know, I think that's part of the function of this podcast is to flip some of this script and say, no, listen to that, read that a little more carefully. It's only 100 doc- 130 doctors who participated. You know, sometimes you don't need everyone. Sometimes you just need enough, you know? The work stoppage, this is a second highlight, the work stoppage, which started Monday and culminated Wednesday with the tentative deal. 
So the action of those quote unquote only 130 doctors culminated in a tentative deal within two days. So I think it's important to highlight that sort of thing uh, because again, you know, these are sources of power uh, when you read stuff like that. So yeah, very inspiring strike coming from New York. Uh, thank you to the doctors and solidarity to them. Uh, we will keep you posted on any updates uh, with, you know, any further healthcare worker strikes or doctor strikes or anything like this. Uh, so this has been very inspiring. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be back next week. Solidarity and love to all. Take care, everyone.